And we are. We're live. I'm here with uh, Mr. Zan Perion. Welcome to the show, Zan. Thank you so much, Sam. So I have I've been a fan of yours for for uh, a while now. Um, I heard about you a long time ago through okay. the sort of community community sphere, the Neil Strauss entrance, which I'm sure uh, a lot of people a lot of people th- found you through that route, and then honestly, I didn't hear that much about you for 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 a number of years after that. And then I found your your book, The Alabaster Girl, mm-hmm. uh, a couple of years ago, and I realized that you had essentially, I think I told you this in the message I reached out to you, but you had put into a much more eloquent and succinct way a lot of the thoughts that I was already having around yeah. this, right? I saw the sort of, I suppose that the, the, the industry, the dating coaching industry going down some very perhaps misguided routes and I was always of the opinion that you know women are ultimately our allies and not our our sort of something to win over or or we're not in some sort of ongoing civil war against men and women and trying to win that battle so to speak so I found your book was enlightening to the extent that it solidified and clarified a lot of the thoughts I was already having Mm -hmm. so for the guys out there that perhaps don't have the same um, experience of your your work and your philosophy, could you just explain to everyone what is Ars Amoratis? Ah, okay. Well, Ars Amorati is the philosophy. It's the company. It's I've been traveling and doing co- coaching and speaking, public speaking and writing, and you know, on a, on the on a crusade for the restoration of of the beauty of relationships and the beauty of masculine edge, feminine mm-hmm. grace, uh, for almost 20 years. And, um, and I've not stopped. <laughs> it's unabated. So uh, what it, very succinctly, what it, the entire mm-hmm. thing is boiled down to, why is there some men that have uh, access to the world and the world of women that other men do not have? And mm-hmm. what do they do and say? What is what is what is in their spirit? What is that energy that makes them stand on the earth with a different aura? And so I try. I've I've observed that, and I've written about it, and I've and I've sought to capture that spirit in men for a couple of decades. So that's kind that's of the awesome. essence, essence of it. Yeah. That is a very succinct. Um, <laughs> very succinct. I wrote a 400 page yeah. book on it. <laughs> yeah. I have never Beautiful stopped book. talking about it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and so 20, 20 years later, now we find ourselves, perhaps if you're someone that, which I imagine you're not, but if you're someone that spends a lot of time on the news and sort of keeping up to date with current affairs, particularly in the Western world, in your country and yeah. in my country in the UK, do you feel personally that the message of the book, uh, the message of, of your philosophy, let's say, is more relevant now or, or less relevant than when you wrote it? Oh, I think it's more relevant. And I really do think that <clears throat> all hands are needed on deck because the ship is sinking. And I'm not pessimistic. I'm very optimistic. But um, but we need uh, we need to have strong, measured voices. And we need to have a good, strong, measured message. And uh, so I think it's men are so so widely lost today, and 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 women are floundering too. And it's like because there's no there's no core. We've lost. You know what it is? I mean, my whole thesis is I'm writing another book, but my whole thesis is that we've turned our face away from something. We've turned our face away from beauty, and by beauty, I I. I mean a transcendent quality in our experiences. So when we look at a piece of art, it has a transcendent quality to move us or a piece of music gives you shivers, you know, free song. Yeah. Goosebumps. And we've scraped that away and slapped that away from all art, architecture, relationships, um, community. And so that we have a real antagonistic um, spirit. The world is wrapped in it. Uh, There's strife. There's, there's turmoil, there's ripping apart, there's brother against brother, that kind of thing. And uh, 
really hostile politics, all this stuff. And I think it's it's a result of us turning away from the contemplative nature of beauty. So that's very abstract, but it's real. It's abstract in nature, but I think it's it's one of those things that people can understand pragmatically, right? I mean, that makes sense on a day-to-day -day basis. We see the manifestations of that. So yeah. it's it's not it's so far abstracted as to not make sense, right? When you say when you say it. Yeah. And yeah. this is obviously a, a very complicated question, but again, if you do your your immaculate condensation of a concept, <laughs> what why is this happening? Why do we find ourselves in this position? Well, okay. I'm I am no uh sociologist or philosopher. Yeah, so or, from the know, perspective But from my perspective, it's it's Nietzsche, I'll, I'll talk philosophically, Nietzsche mm. said, you know, God is dead and we have killed him. And what he meant was that, and, people, and the, the atheists of the world say, well, hey, that's a triumph. See, even Nietzsche is on our side. But what Nietzsche was lamenting and he was, he was worried that because we've replaced all of the entire history of human culture has been bound up in spirituality and religion. And that's been, that's been, shunted aside so we have to make a morality out of just humanism and he said beware because everything's on the chopping block when you get rid of a spiritual sense of looking at the world that's what Nietzsche was saying so I, I that's broad strokes but I, I do think that we've I, I did an entire podcast with Jordan called the Zan and Jordan show uh, mm. We did nine episodes talking about this very theme, this very concept of why are we here? Where did we come from? Why are we here? Why is it this way? And where is it possible to go? So technology has replaced religion as our driving force. And technology is pure competition. It's just faster, smaller, you know, and it and it's unrelenting. And I'm not saying anything good or bad about that. I like technology. <laughs> but... Mm. Um, I think we've just lost, it. we have stopped as a culture, as it, all cultures, as a community, as a family, as a man and a woman, we've stopped the sense of contemplation. Aristotle said the only life worth living is one of contemplation. And we don't do that. We just rush, rush, we consume, we rush, we consume, we, we pick at others, we pick at each other, and there's no contemplative life. And that's the problem. Yeah. Yeah. So... For people who perhaps aren't of the, let's say, dogmatic mindset, people who don't believe in um, a religion just on the yeah. basis that it's, uh, you know, it's it's historically people have believed it. What is the alternative for people who are of a spiritual disposition? They want to, they want to contemplate. They want to look for beauty. They want to yeah. to love art. They want to reconnect with the world and with nature and, and become grounded. But they don't want to believe in something that is, let's say, yeah. scientifically impossible. What is the what yeah. is the answer to that? Vacuum? Well, all of us have. Here, here's the underlying thing. You know, start with first principles. We all have a longing for beauty. Everybody. I don't care. Any religion that is in a person's soul or any atheistic uh, bent, everybody is is caught up in, in moments of ecstasy of, you know, to see the face of their beloved, for instance, smiling at them, or to see a piece of, or hear a piece of music, or to see a sunset. We're all moved by beauty, and we all have a longing for beauty in our lives, all, across all the spectrum of religions, non-religions, everything. So I think that's the underlying thesis. I think beauty is the religion. I really do. I think that call for beauty, which we're starved for, is agnostic to beliefs um, or non-beliefs. It's across the spectrum. And so we can fall back on that. <clears throat> Excuse me. That we have that desire for a beautiful experience in life, for a beautiful relationship, for a beautiful family, for a beautiful life well lived when we're old. We all have that. We all have that desire for that. And so um, that's... That's the fundamental essence of it. I mean, it's, I know that's abstract, but it's it is what has re, it, it is what is necessary to replace this feeling of void and absurdism and existentialism that we've been sitting in for the last hundred years. It's what's needed to fill that again 
with meaning. Beauty is meaning. And uh, <laughs> so I'm writing a book and it's not easy because it's, I, I can't even articulate it and I can't even, and I don't even know it. I'm going, my yeah. book, The Alabaster Master Girl, it came out of my experience. I, I, it took me 10 years to write and I never read a book the entire time I was writing it. And I love books because I didn't want to influence it. I wanted to just dump this out of my soul. You know, I just wanted to vomit it out and I got the book done and that book is put away. And I never read any books during that time. But this next book I'm writing, I'm 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 consuming and reading like crazy. I'm reading the, the ancients and the, you know um, Greek and Roman myth, you, you know uh, philosophy and stuff. I, I have to because I have nothing in me to talk about beauty or this experience or the modern culture of the world. I have who, who, I have nothing to say, but it's all been said before. So yeah, it's it's one of those maybe difficult areas to address because it's kind of self evident. Right. It's like one of those beauty is one of those concepts or words where if you're asked to describe it, it, it is what it is in every That's sense. Correct. Like, yeah. So, yeah, trying to unpack a word that can only be described by its meaning is a difficult feat indeed. Well, I think uh, and here's my delusion <laughs> because I, <laughs> I'm crazy. I do think that from the I mean, you asked, I'll say it from the beginning of of what we know as time, whether it was started by a prime mover, like a creator or a big bang, doesn't matter. Whatever that, that beginning was, there was this, this explosion of expansion. And, and this expansion was molecules and was, was gases. And, and I really think that beauty is a real thing that was born at the same time. And it's a real strata, just like in a, in a computer networking model, there's the application layer, the, the network layer, the, you know, all these different layers. I think that there's a real strata la layer of a real physical thing called beauty. Mm. That's my thesis. So that's your sort of, I suppose, first yeah. principle is that beauty isn't something that's created in the mind. It's more of a field that one can tap into. It's, it's like gravity. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, dark energy, dark matter, maybe that's beauty. I don't know. But I really do think it's real because we can, we experience it. When you hear a musical note, um, a musical note sounds lovely. But you can put another musical note at the same time, and now you have harmony. And that harmony gets us, you can feel it in your skin. You can physically feel it. We're tapping into something that is, exist that is transcendent to our experience. Science can't describe it. Science doesn't even try. They say, oh, eventually we'll figure it out. And, but, you know, the, the idea of goosebumps and, and getting that shiver in the back of your spine, science has no real explanation for that. Yeah. So... So it's real. It's a physical, real thing. I believe in physics, and I think physics is that. Well, I'm, I'm talking a lot, but <laughs> no, it's okay, man. Please, yeah, please talk, do, keep going, man. I'm fascinated by it. <clears throat> yeah, I think it's. Uh, I really do think that. Uh, huh. We, you know, Maslow talked about peace, peak experiences, right? He talked mm -hmm. about we have your food, water and shelter met. Now you have a transcendent quality in the higher thing. And we're, we're hungry for that. We want, we have a cult of ugliness wrapping the world. And, and art used to be about the art. Now it's about the artist, just like everything else. It's the reality TV ethic. You know, it's, a, it's about me, me, me. Our entire, this, this volume of generation is all about me. The number one genre of books sold in the world right now is memoir. Look at me more. And I'm only 22 and I'm writing my memoir, you know, and it's just, it's, we're awash with it. And, and everything is centered around me. The artist now is the famous thing, not the art. It's, yeah. it's the name of the artist. And, you know, and, and so we've really turned because we've turned our face away from something transcendent. We've turned inward and said, yeah, we're the only thing that's important. And, and it's causing all of our, um, this this navel gazing and this and this self-help generation yeah. self-help you know it's the the other genre of books that's uh, that's outselling all of this is self-help and mm -hmm. i'm not against self-help per se but i'm against the self-help machine yeah you know i think that it's i think it's a it's it's um it's overwhelming us and we all have the answer right there on a shelf and we get, and we all have the little, you know, platitude we can put on Facebook update 
a, you know, quote that inspires us, but we're all, we're, but we're all churning around in mental disorder, uh, depression, because we've turned our face away from uh, an external looking at the transcendent, which is beauty. That's my, yeah. I really think. No, it, I, <laughs> it makes, it makes a lot of, it makes a lot of sense to me as well. Um, I was thinking about this concept uh, yesterday, actually, which is that we've sort of turned away from death as well as an integral part of life. We no longer right. really think about, look toward or, or focus, in a sense, on our own mortality. Correct. And I was thinking about the sort of similarities between the seeking of immortality and the seeking to optimize everything to some sort of perfect state, right? This kind of, this sense that now we're trying to constantly be more efficient. We're trying to do more. We're trying to package each experience into a small block of time. In a sense, that's sort of akin to the seeking of immortality because it's saying like right. at some perfect point, there's gonna be this equilibrium where I can do everything. Everything I've ever dreamed of, everything that's been expected of me, everything that society deems yeah. to be the, the life of a life well lived if i just get efficient enough i can reach that and that's essentially in my view the same as the, the searching for immortality that's exactly 100 percent correct ernest becker wrote a book called the the denial of death mm -hmm. and it's basically we are consuming and filling up our our lives with addictions and all this kind of stuff to avoid the presence of death to avoid thinking about our, our mortality mm -hmm. and you're 100 correct it's um we we are we're flittering until it hits us and then we're, and then you know we're, we're felled like a tree and yeah. and and now we're done so it's yeah it, there's a there, there's there's a lot to be said about it and i really do think that you know you look at 100 120 years ago like the turn from 1900 to, to 1920 look at the upheaval in the world world war one the Spanish flu decimated the, the, you know, the world, yeah. um, worse than coronavirus ever did. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and that lasted a good couple of years. And, and then, and, and, and Einstein came up with his revolutionary, um, bringing in this cha this chaotic or this probabilistic uncertain model of the universe which just shocked the world uh which is incredible and brilliant in my mind so all these things happened in that 20-year period and out of that was born this modern society and i think we're paralleling where we're having a similar 20-year period you know and at this at, at now i think i kind of think and this is me, me being crazy i kind of think there's going to be a, an einstein type figures arrive that's going to have some, look at this. We never thought of this before. <laughs> I think so. <laughs> um, but anyway, um, cultures have shifted, you know, and, 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 and I'm not, obviously there's a lot of people talking about this and in, in better ways than I can, but my fundamental thesis is that we've lost, we have a desire and a longing since we're born for beauty, for the transcendent, for, for an experience. You know, we used to use words. Now we're like, that's my girl. And now we can't even say my girl nowadays. That's politically incorrect. Mm -hmm. You can't say, well, you girls look nice. No, we're women. You can't say that. You know, yeah. it's, it, you've, you've stripped that out from, from the voice. So, but what we, so we say, this is my partner, my spouse. Yeah. Okay. And we have this detached feel about our thing. And what we've forgotten in kind of the biblical sense is the is this is our beloved mm. this is our beloved and and so we'd have these relationships that are just utilitarian and go through the motions get married uh have sex in the first couple of years and then and that gone that's gone and go to do their jobs trying to get a better house and just and have an affair get divorced and you know we have this entire thing of it because we don't look at each other man and woman as this is my beloved and and she, and her smile is, is part of my transcendent uh, thing that I've been yearning this. And when, when we feel that in the other, there's a sense of devotion. There's a sense of adoration. There's a sense of being proud. How many guys out there have a wife um, or vice versa? And she's not proud of you. Can you imagine what a thought?
that your wife or your your girlfriend is not proud of who you are. She doesn't look over at a party and she's you're talking with people over and she's over here and she looks over and she thinks to herself, that's my guy. Yeah. I'm proud of who he is and what he's trying to do and vice versa. If you're not proud of the girl you're with, of the woman you're with, if you're not proud of her as who, who she is as a person, she can feel it, you can feel it. What's the point? So yeah. it's all down. I mean, everything I've done and it, the things you're doing is all about this, this, this uh, polarity and the, in the integration of men with women, right? It's like relationships have been our, our fort. Um, however, it's all the same thing. When I'm talking about, you know, Nietzsche and beauty, it's the same thing. Anybody that spent any time in this and you, for sure you yeah. um, realizes that this, this dance between men and women is the same thing that we're talking about when we talk philosophically about beauty. We've lost that sense of transcendence in relationship. I can yeah, go on. I, and... No, I, I, I'm we're on the yeah. same page, brother. So this is really interesting me, to me because I think for a lot of guys now, some of the ways that we're talking will just go straight over some people's head. It's almost yeah. like you need a, a kind of gateway, like a gateway drug into the search for beauty. Now, yeah. from your perspective, obviously, the Alabaster Girl is really focused on the search for beauty with direct experience with women being right. that access key, that entrance point. Correct. Do you believe that that's a sort of universal portal into the world of beauty for men, right? Do you believe well, that if a man is abstracted from beauty, if he's detached from beauty, that focusing on direct experience with women can be his, let's say, gateway drug? For sure. I mean, it was certainly mine. It doesn't have to be the only way. It could be an artistic, you know, path through life. It could be seeking, you know, your, your highest expression in art. But absolutely, it is a, it's a seeking mind. And anybody who's watching your podcast or listening to your podcast is only doing so because they are, number one, sincere in their desire to learn something about themselves and be, stand on this earth better. And, and number two, they are seeker. There's a lot, like you said, there's a maybe 80% of the men and women out there are not seekers and they just, yeah. they just consume and they exist and they, and a, and a day rolls into another and they don't have a, 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 an inner monologue and they don't look out the window and wonder, you know, and stand on a balcony and, and ponder. They don't do it. But the 20% that do this message is, is aligned with them and because they're seekers and they're treasure hunters of a life that well lived. So, um, and yeah, and, and, and I'm talking abstract and, and somebody who is a seeker, but they're, they're, they've not thought about these things for a long time and think, well, what am I going to do with that? I can't get, can't get a, a pick up a girl this weekend with, you know, this concept of beauty, but it's all the same thing. It's all the same. Just it's, it's 100% aligned with everything. And, um, uh, yeah, I think, uh, Seeking, seeking an experience in life that heads towards beauty, whether it's art or women, <clears throat> will give you the abstract. I, you know, I wrote in my book that a man's love life has a kind of different uh, stages. The number one stage is you don't know what you're doing and you're sincere and you fall in love with the first girl and you think this is going uh, to last forever. And you get your heart broken. The second stage is you've had your heart broken a couple of times. Now you get a little jaded. And you just play the field a bit, maybe you have a marriage, maybe a second marriage. And you just kind of go through that as you do in other things like career and stuff like that. The third stage, if you continue, is you start to really recognize. Uh, so it's, it's one woman at the beginning. Then it's several women in the, in the center or the second stage. The third stage is about the essence of women themselves, which is what is it about the female spirit? that nurtures me, that is amused to me, that makes me inspired to do things. And because you've been seeking further, most people have only never get past level two to, you know, just marriages, divorces. But if you continue to seek, you're gonna consider what is the nature of the female spirit in relation to the male spirit, the polarity, which you've also lost today, and the importance of that life-giving energy in, in, in our lives to be able to create, to to build societies, to, to want to write, to do poetry, whatever. And then the fourth stage is, so one woman, bunch of several women mixed up together. 
the art the the artistry of the female spirit itself is the third phase and the fourth phase that you will get to for sure if you continue the seeking is the con the contemplation of beauty itself which is you know and and i wrote this in my book and plato said the same thing you know two thousand years ago or, or 2600 years ago plato said the same thing it's nothing new that i've ever said it's the same thing it's it's the it's the seeking toward the real, which we can see today, which is a shadow to what is the ideal form. And so it's a platonic ideal. And, uh, yeah. and that's Alabaster Girl. That's the title of the book. The Alabaster Girl is, is an abstract uh, platonic ideal of that, of, that, of that girl we've had in our hearts since we were young. Mm. The one that we, we, want, we want to make us feel alive you know so yeah it's it's the woman that we see reflections of when we when we see that woman pass us in the day and she makes you feel something really deep on a fundamental level that is like some reflection of the spirit of the feminine right. some reflection of the alabaster and that's a touch with the divine the transcendent it's absolutely it's the same thing as listening to a piece of music that you'll never forget it everybody that's listening to this podcast can remember a time when a girl said something to them for instance, if, for the guys that they never forgot. Mm. I remember when I was, I was 19, 20, 21, and I was just completely lost with women and so insecure and so beating myself up. And I would go to the bars by myself and stand there all night till the lights came on. And, and I remember one time being frustrated and lost again. And I walked out of this bar and there was a girl sitting down on a curb off to the right. And she was sitting there just by herself. And she and I glanced over and she smiled at me. Beautiful, <laughs> most beautiful things I've ever seen. She smiled at me. She said, hello. I said, uh, hi. And she, she, she told me her name. And she asked me to sit down beside her. And she talked to me for maybe three, four minutes. And then she had to leave. She wasn't from the town. She wasn't from that city. And she had to leave. And she was like this. I don't remember her name or anything. But I, she was like this angel that touched, that came in. And I've never forgotten it. So imagine that act of kindness, that act of, of clear eye invitation from her is something that I never forgot. It broke my heart. And I thought, this is what I want. I want to have that no games, no manipulation, no convincing, just a, just the clear eyed adoration. And this is my beloved, that feel, you know, yeah. so much that it affected me that I remembered it all these years enough to tell the story. So the question I have to the, 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 the men and women on your pod that are listening to this is you all have maybe have a story like that. Is somebody remember that flashed through and you can't stop forget you, you never forgot about it. So have you ever been that person for someone else? Yeah. Has then, is there somebody on this earth 20 years later thinking, man, I'll never forget that guy. Just two minutes or three minutes. He said something to me in a right. Yeah. Or I, or had it, or I, I spent a night with him or I spent, I had a one month love affair with this man, or it was my relationship, you know, 100%. and I still have that feeling of, wow, I am a better person. And I, and I touched something that I've been yearning for because I, I, I knew that I knew that man. Yeah. Or I, I met him briefly. It, it's, it's, I completely agree, man. Like it's so interesting. I find with my coaches. Hey, I think I lost you. Did I lose you? Uh, I think I lost you, Sam. My internet's working. Uh, hello. Hello. Let me just check my internet, make sure it's all good. Yep, I'm good. I guess I'm on the show by myself. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Welcome to my show. I don't know if this is still going. It says it's still live. Um, let's see here. Disconnected. I think we disconnected briefly, but ah. that's OK. We <laughs> haven't missed anything. Yeah, we're back. We're back. Um, yeah, I was I was just I was just gonna say like I I feel very 
connected to what you just said because what I used when I started coaching about seven years ago, what I thought would be the thing that made guys most excited was the idea that women would respond well to them, right? That women would just smile at them and, and think that they're a cool guy or feel connected to them in some yeah. way. And what I was kind of surprised and amazed to find was that the message that connected most with the guys that I was teaching was that they could be an agent of change in their world, right? So there was this idea that not just getting a good response from a woman, right? That's nice, but really what motivated them and what connected them to the, the higher experience of what they were doing, going up and becoming social and talking to people and taking that chance was that throughout the most part of their life, they felt like they were sort of in the passenger seat of their life. They were just watching things go by. And when they started going out and meeting women for the first time, they saw the real effect of them deciding to take this chance. And they saw the way that that sort of butterfly effect, that one moment gives that girl that feeling inside. And then she goes and talks to her friends and then her friends change their view about what men are like. And in that moment, the power that a guy can feel knowing that he can actually create some sort of different version of the future through his action you know he can actually enact change upon the world that was the message that connected most strongly with my clients and i think a lot of the time when guys think that they want to be good with girls or they want women to like them really what they they're really looking for is this sense that they are actually a participant in their life right they can actually enact change upon the world that they have what it takes that's what men want you know, um, um, I, I've been asked this, I wrote it in my book too, that, you know, what do women want? The old age old Freudian question, yeah. what do women want? And I think that women want what they wanted since they were little girls. And, and when they were a little girl and they were, you know, in the living room twirling around in the little dress and saying to the daddy, daddy, look at me, please notice me, look at me. They wanted to be noticed. They wanted to be seen. And I think women still want that today. Uh, feminists might say, oh, I don't agree with you. That's okay. I can accept that, you know, but it's real and, and I'm not wrong. <laughs> and then what, then the next question is, what do men want? And I think like, you, as you said, men want the same thing they wanted when they were little boys. They want to know that they have what it takes. They want to know that, that they can enter a room and represent themselves with autonomy, with conviction, with, with confidence. And that's all the, that's all we wanted when we little boys. We wanted to know that we could go over that jump with our bike. We wanted to know that I have the t- what it takes to do that. And the enormous feeling of accomplishment and, and victory and pleasure we got from going over that, even if we fell, is yeah. just, we've been seeking that all our lives. We want to know we have that. We, so yeah. guys will say, or, or the media has said to me, I've been on lots of, you know, interviews and stuff, and they say, well, um, it's ridiculous that men would pay twenty five hundred dollars for a weekend boot camp uh, or intensive um, because uh, they're just trying to pay for sex. They're just trying to pay to, for twenty five hundred dollars. You can buy a lot of sex. Yeah, it's not yes. what they're trying to buy at all. They're not trying to buy that. They're trying to buy the ability to know that they have what it takes and when it comes to interacting with women. And they, you said this. It's not they want to pick up women. Really fun. They might think so. And there's nothing. You know. That's okay. They're figuring it out. They're, they're, they're new in life and or new in this thing. They think they want to pick up women, but what underneath it is they, you said it, they want women to like them. They want to be lovable. They want women to say, I like that. I know this guy. I, I like that. I, I met him. And so that they have what it takes to show up, represent themselves, to speak the truth, to be able to ask a girl out as opposed to all this hesitation stuff we do. So yeah, you hit it right on. So, Sam, there seems to be like a, a big sort of, let's say, counter movement um, it, with the black pill movement and things like that. And what they're essentially saying is that not all men have what it takes, right? They say, you were born a certain way. I was born a certain way. The reason why you can talk about this and you can sit here on your high horse and talk about it is because you have what it takes. You, let's say, won the genetic lottery. <laughs> Not even as far as is concerned with just looks, but yeah. in some sense, you know, you were born with the, the verbal dexterity to 
hold good conversations. You were born with the positive emotion to be able to look at the world through the lens of beauty. Uh -huh. So what would you say perhaps to men, the increasing number of men that are adopting this black pill philosophy, which states that some men do not fundamentally have what it yeah. takes? <clears throat> I don't buy that because um, in, in, in your words, like you were born with a sense of articulation and a way of speaking, or you're born with a genetic thing, or you're born with the worldview that, you know, that of, of, of conviction and co confidence. That's not true. Um, I, me as an example, I had none of this. I was tongue tied, afraid. I was in my, my, my twenties. I think the number one uh, character trait I had was embarrassed. I was always embarrassed, 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 embarrassed. I was always felt intimidated by other men. You know, as somebody, the guy would show up and he says a joke and the girl I was liking starts to laugh. I would be racked with torment for days after that, you know, mm -hmm. so, and, and not speaking and not, and, you know, so I don't buy it. Every bit of this can be chosen. Number one. No, first of all, awareness. I, aware, I wrote in my book, awareness is curative just by being aware that there's potentiality. It contains the cure. And so awareness that is possible. Number two, choose. Not wait for, not wait for women to be nice, not wait for, all those self-help books to finally give me the answer to choose no more, no more of the old story that didn't serve me. Yes. I was abandoned. Yes. I was abused. Yes. I was betrayed. Yes. I was, I was not loved, but that's the old story. And I'm going to go forward with a new story. It's a conscious choice that man has to make. You, you, you mentioned Jordan Peterson. He talks about this, take responsibility of your life. When he says, clean your room, what he means is stand on this earth, stand on this earth, take, responsibility for doing something for yourself. So, um, so you, so you choose it. And then if you continue this path of this treasure seeking heart of this wanting to know, it doesn't matter your height, your social status, your, you, you know, uh, your, your poverty level, you will drift into as you go through the years and it does take time into an understanding with a keener look at the world, with a different perspective, with an eye toward beauty, it's 100% possible for anybody. I really think so. And ones that, that go down a different path and say, they give up and say, nah, it's, women are mean. Women, we need to take back the power from women. Um, and, and, they, and they entrench themselves. These modern men's movements, you know, they're, 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 they're painting their faces and sitting in the forest and beating drums and we're men, yeah, and they're dancing around the fire. But they're doing it without the, the saving life, grace, and counterbalance beauty of women. It's men being with men, as opposed to men being with men in the company and in and, and the bathing influence of women. So. Yeah. And it's reinforcing, right? It's the, it's the echo chamber. It, and it's so dangerous because once you start having those thoughts, women are manipulative, women are gold diggers. Right. Women are fundamentally interested in your resources. It's just, it's amazing how sometimes an abstract idea can be so clearly seen in real life. And for me, you know, I'm in Rio de Janeiro, which is a city, you, you know, the city, I, I, yeah, I, knew. I, I heard about some of your experiences there, but it, it's a place where every experience is essentially available. And a good friend of mine from New York, a very sort of, you know, high earning uh, CEO professional, he, you know, he told me like, you know, I think all women are prostitutes essentially. Yeah. And, you know, I go and talk to a woman. She doesn't respond to me. I offer her some money. She's around my house in five, 10 minutes, right? Boyfriend or not, she'll come around to get the gift. And mm -hmm. I thought about it and, and, you know, I was thinking, why is that? That never happens to me, right? I never seem to meet these women. And it became really, it became really obvious that the fact that he is viewing the world through that lens, that women are gold diggers, that women are seeking his resources means that not only is he more likely to stumble upon those women and to resonate on some level with women who are at least currently more inclined towards that. Sure, and there are. But, but, but he's bringing those qualities out even in women who aren't typically like that, right? You talk about the Madonna and the whore, that sort of, that example yeah. sounds a little bit politically incorrect now, but the idea that women have these two sides, right? They, they wanna be, 
They want to be comforted. They want to be looked after. They want to help, but they also want the adventure, the rough side, the darker side of life. Correct. And, and, and it, it, it's like that. If you start having these thoughts, you're going to start attracting women who are more inclined to that. And also you're going to start bringing out those, those sort of mentalities in all women. That you Correct. You hundred percent nailed it. You're saying it exactly 100% aligned and perfect. It's we're, what gets drawn to us is what we're me magnetizing for. That's the kind of metal that sticks on us. And, and you're right. And, the, and, you know, society is broken and there's not a lot of good messages. So men are, are raised without a good um, viewpoint or idea of, of masculine, the greatness of masculine spirit and women, the same thing. So there's a lot of people that are shallow and, and cause they're not aware or they don't care. And you, you, I can run into, I can go into a bar in Manhattan with that guy and I can say hi to a girl and she could say the same thing or she could be just completely, um, we're talking here, you know, it could happen. It happens. It, and it's like, it's, it's, um, but the whole point is, is we're taking a run around the societal. I've been on radio shows. Uh, I was on a, a, a woman's sex show one time. She said, you know, what do you think about uh, pornography? what it's done to the society. And I said, well, <laughs> that's a good question. And the truth is, I yes, I know that pornography is everywhere. It's pervasive. And sure, I imagine it, I'm certain that it had some impact on our, on our notions of physicality, body uh, dysmorphia, um, relationships, intimacy, <clears throat> sex. All it's, Of course, it's affected society. But there's enough voices out there talking about it. They don't need me. So I don't talk about feminism. I don't talk about men going their own way. I don't talk about um, pornography. We go, we take an end run around that and talk about, <clears throat> and talk about these, these great qualities that we want to seek in men and women. So it's, it's, and, and it's a call forth. So the guy that thinks that all women are gold diggers or prostitutes in, in, in Manhattan, it's a call forth to that man to say, no, there's a better way of looking at it. And, and it's real. Yeah. And you don't have to have that. And they don't know because they know, there's no light. All they see yeah. is darkness. And that's what they were raised in this culture of that. So they don't see that there is a light. And <clears throat> excuse me, my voice. I just got over COVID. <laughs> oh, it wasn't no. bad, but, but I got a little tickle in my throat. Um, so, so, you know, I, it, I, I, I've said for years, you know, head toward the light and only the light. Don't, don't wade through feminism in pornography and all these societal things. There's no, there's, there's millions of voices talking, but they don't need to hear mine. Right. So go around it, head toward the light and only the light. And then the men say, but there is no light. Well, then the answer to that is, well, yeah, I, I see, I get that. So be the light. Yeah. You have to Just be create the light. a flicker, right? Create exactly. a spark. Yeah. Oh man, that's, that's amazing. Yeah. yeah. yeah I, I talk a lot to clients about this because uh, they, they often say to me, well, look, my issue is approach anxiety, right? That it's just sure. always, it's like, how do I get over approach anxiety? How do I stop my approach anxiety? And what I say to them, and I never, I, I never used to do this. It's only in the past three years or so that I've learned this, but everything you talk or think about is a propaganda machine in your own mind. Mm -hmm. So if I spend 30, 40 minutes talking to a client about their approach anxiety, what are they going to be thinking about at the end of that? And what am I going to be advertising to their mind? Well, approach anxiety, right? So it, it's almost like there's this direct approach where yeah. instead of saying, how do we resolve approach anxiety and further advertising that concept in our mind, you just say, focus on the opposite. Focus on the woman in the world right now. Focus Correct. on your direct experience. Focus on what you see what you hear, what you feel, what you breathe, and go straight towards that. And you can divert the problem altogether by going in yeah, the opposite direction. Yeah, 100%. And you, it, it is a big thing for men of every age. They're, they don't, they're tongue tied. They don't know what to say. They, they don't think they're articulate enough or funny enough. Uh, uh, you know, all these things. But, you know, we, so we, we have a lot of confusion. There's a lot we don't know. But the way I, I say it is this to men. You know, Aristotle talked about begin with first principles. So what is the first principle? What do you know to be true? Number one, I'm lonely. 
I know that to be true. Number two, I'm horny. I know that to be true. Number three, I like, I like women. That's a, that's a basic fundamental principle that I know to be true. And that looks like a woman that I'm attracted to. No one can say those are not true. It was postulates are not, there's, they're not real. They are. No woman can say that's not real. It's true. It's 100% true. You know that to be true. So you just settle into what you know to be true about you. And then you speak that truth. That's it. I like you. I, I was over there with my friend, Sam, and I saw you and I had to come say hi. And I don't know what to say next, but I had to say it. I think you're, I think you're, you're attractive. And I had to come say hi. That's first principles. There's no question in that. There's no, will you like me? Can I buy you a drink? There's statement, 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 statement of truths that you know to be true. And I would like to see you again. That's a statement. Can you, can you imagine that? That's not, um, well, uh, are you busy this weekend? You're saying, I would like to see you again. Zip, shut up. Statement of truth that no one can, she can't reject it. She can't say, I know, I reject that. It is a truth. I would like to see you again. She might want something different, right? Because she's a free agent and you want her, yeah, absolutely. But I would like to see you again. That has, is, as great as a, a pickup line as anything on earth. I would like to see you again. I don't know how but I would like to see you again. That's all I know. I can't, I have a boyfriend. I can't, I'm married. Uh, I, I, I can't, I'm, I'm, I'm busy with studies, but thank you. I can't, but thank you. And I understand, okay? At, at, least, I, at least I stood on this earth and did, and, and, and did my job as a man. At least I, I, I spoke my truth. I can go home, lay in my bed tonight, and I can think, yeah, at least I showed up. Yeah. Which is, you know, what we've been wanting. It's like 100%. this approach anxiety, it's it's like a cheetah, you know. A cheetah's a cheetah's on the in the in the on the savanna, and he's and he's crawling through the grass, the deep grass, like this, a millimeter at a time for six hours, and the antelopes are all right there grazing, and he gets closer and closer, and he's at the edge of the tall grass, and the tension's there, and the and the wildlife, are, you know, videographers are filming the whole thing, and he's creeping. All of a sudden, he springs into action. This cheetah, this six hours of coiled tension springs into action and heads right for the antelope he's been eyeing this single one the antelope immediately without thinking too takes off and there and this is this chase you know just bolting and the antelope zigging zagging and stuff like that and and as 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 the the cheetah gets closer and closer and closer and you think is just about to grab it and he swipes in slow motion with his paw like this and hits the rump of the antelope but the antelope spins and jumps and goes that way and and the 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 uh the cheetah goes head over heels in the dust, big dust cloud, and he lands on his on his on his face, and the antelope's gone. What does the cheetah do? He gets up. What does he do? He licks his balls and he looks around. Does he think oh, I failed again? I'm not good at this. Does he does he blame himself? No, he just says, eh, missed that one. I'm still hungry. <laughs> I guess I'll have to go, you know. So it's that same spirit that, you know, we, we blame ourselves as opposed to realizing that sometimes life has a way that escapes from us. So 100%. Yeah. you're so right. And it's, it's like, it's another example of just a lot of our answers come from just looking to nature, right? If you literally have a question and you look at how another animal deals with the question that you're asking of yourself, Correct. you can usually find an answer, right? And there's, there's real physiological like evidence of this and versions of this. It's the same with ducks. When two mallards, two male ducks fight, they have an argument, they have a territorial fight. As soon as that fight finishes, win or lose, the ducks shake their body. You see them go into this sort of frenetic shaking. And what they're literally doing on a physiological level is shaking the tension out of their bodies. But with, with guys, when they feel that same thing, right? Because each approach that they do at the start can feel like their own little battle, right? We've sort of been socialized out of reacting, right? Maybe what you actually want to do on a fundamental level is scream, right? Either in happiness or in just the, that, that adrenaline and that overwhelm, but we can't do that. So we just sort of like, we ponder in our mind. We, we, again, we look inwards because yes. we don't have that physiological, you know, you can't just shake your hands off and jump up and down and go and run it off, right? So we, we're almost right. like building up tension and then just holding it all in our bodies. Yeah, and you know the difference between neediness and desire. Desire is beautiful. Great desire is is, is mm. I, I've said this before. 
Desire is the number one thing women cannot resist as opposed to neediness, which is a very fine line. Neediness is a, is a taking energy. It's a, it's a vacuum type of energy. I'm sucking. And uh, desire is something that you, that is goes from you out to the world. I have this desire to have a great life, to have a great experience, to meet a girl like you. I have a, a desire for you. That's a gift because you've been given a gift. You've been given a gift from on high and you pass it through. And, and that gift is your sexual desire. You were born with sexual desire. Men say, how do I, how do I increase my sexual uh, uh, awareness? Uh, you watch porn all day long, you know? So don't tell me you don't have that. And, 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 and we're taught that it's toxic today and it's shameful and men should, you know, men are one step away from being a rapist. That's wrong. That's a, that's a crime that's, that society is dumping upon men. Um, we were born with this sexual energy coursing through us and, and, and to love it and to embrace it and say, this is who I am. And, and I will not apologize now and, uh, with respect and empathy and all these great, you know, wonderful tempering uh, elements. Um, I think, yeah, we're wide ranging here, but I think uh, there's a disservice to men. And that's why men in this society, they don't know where to turn and they have no way. There's no messages for men. Very few. Yeah. That's I why what you're doing is, is, is what you're doing is God's work. I really think so. Yeah. You, know, you give a message to a guy, you teach him to stand on this earth and go say hi to a girl, which he hasn't done. Which he has he's never done. He's 30, 31 years old and he's never had the energy or, or the, the impetus because nobody teaches you how to do life. Yeah. That you're sincere. You know, we beat ourselves up all the time and think, well, I suck at this. And why can't I learn this? Why can't I get better? And I, I tried to talk to that girl last night and she rejected me. We beat ourselves up. Remember the cheater, right? He does, he does need to just, oh, well. Um, but the idea is that we beat ourselves up. But you can forgive yourself everything because you were sincere. Your heart was real. Your desire and your attempt to talk to that woman was the best you knew how. You would, no one taught us how to do life. No one taught us how to do this. So you can forgive yourself for any seeming mistakes because you can look in the mirror and say, I, at least I'm, I'm trying. You were a student of life. And so yeah. you never have to beat yourself up and say, oh, I should have done that better. No, nobody taught you. You didn't know. And was your, was your, was your attempt really sincere? Did you really mean, did, were you really trying to move forward in a good way with that woman yesterday? If you were, and it fell, and it fell flat, and she, re, she uh, ignored you, walked away, whatever, you, you, you know that you, at, at, that you can look in the mirror and say, I, I tried, I did. And, I'm, yeah. and you can forgive yourself everything. You've done right by yourself, right? Done you right by yourself. Done what you needed to. Or you, you can't control even how you're going to feel in that specific interaction. Really, right. all you control is that inner sense of, I feel some sense of tension or nervousness. And in taking that action, I don't know what's going to come out of my mouth. I don't even know if I'm going to be able to speak. But if I show up, that was the step that I needed to take. And Correct. that was exactly where I needed to be and what I needed to do. That's right. Yeah, that's great. Awesome, man. So um, let's try and let's try and see if we can make something a bit practical. And this is maybe this isn't the most exciting question, but uh, I'm I'm coaching like a group of like four guys at the moment, and okay, they're doing incredibly. Like the the, the way that they support each other, and the way that they kind of can be do my job for me in some senses, sure. and just push each other and just be each other's own sort of support system and role model is, is amazing. But I think for a lot of guys, they, they don't really feel like they have space or time in their day-to-day -day lives. We're not all gypsy pirates. So for right. guys that are maybe working that nine to five and, and maybe in their downtime, they feel kind of exhausted and they just literally don't yeah. see the pockets or windows of time during which they can go out and create this sort of lifestyle, these sort of moments for themselves. What would be your advice to guys like that? Yeah, that's a tough one. And so they see so for the dating world, because they're so busy and they don't have time to go out and linger somewhere, they, mm -hmm. they go to swiping apps and this kind of stuff, right? The, the Tinders of the world, I guess. Um, I, I think you should, if you really have this desire and you want to understand this, you should rearrange your life as best you can. Obviously not quit your job or something, but maybe so. Maybe so. There's, there's, 
there's men who are in their 20s and they say, well, I don't know my next step. I'll tell you next step. In the Bible, God said to Abraham, Abram, he said, leave your father's house, leave your country and go to a place that I will show you, to a land that I will show you. And, and I think that's a great, great message. You're in Rio because you wanted to, you're, 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 you're looking, you're looking to find something, right? Now, I'm not saying you have to do that because this journey is really an inner journey as opposed to leaving, you know, the, the city you're in and the great job you have, for instance, and maybe you love it. So I'm not, I'm not saying just quit everything, but you should rearrange your spare time so that you can have the sense of, let me put it this way, to be, to go out and prowl around the city, you know, go to a wine, uh, wine um, uh, tasting, go to a, an art gallery opening in your city. Go to go to something that has got uh, a lingering quality. If you go to it, there's an art gallery that is having a, a, an exhibition for that evening, and you hear you read about it, look it up on the internet over that weekend. You can have men and women there, and the women are largely single that go to these things. They're going to be there lingering, looking at the mm. art, tasting some grapes and cheese. It's a lingering energy, and it's a movement energy, and that that kind of thing is where. If I if I went to a brand new city, I would probably go do someplace like that if I didn't know anybody. So things like that. It's not easy in this modern age, especially with Corona and and uh, and everybody's expecting the dating to come from the from their phones now. So, but still, uh, analog. I'm, I'm from the analog world, you know. I'm the last. I was with, I was in in Switzerland a while ago with a good friend of mine. He's 25 years old, and we we're having a glass of wine sitting there talking he's in, in his house and he said zan hmm they don't make them like you anymore they don't make guys like you anymore now, hey that's <laughs> nice that's carl that's a nice compliment thank you brother that's cool no 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 you're missing what i'm saying it's not possible for somebody to be born in this cu culture and go through what you went through which is yeah. an analog experience with women before digital you had to straighten your tie get up your nerve your buddy had to elbow you you go up and you try and talk to her. That was your only recourse mm -hmm. before online dating stuff. Like that and he said nobody else is going to have to go through that that that, that we know of. So it's like mm -hmm. it's, it's an interesting thought. It's like uh, but a analog is premium. All the people that have spent a lot of time on Tinder and stuff like that they would love to know. Imagine this: we had ten years of fifteen years of online dating, 20, 20 years of online dating. 10 years of it being titter, Tinder or whatever. And then two years of coronavirus lockdown. There's an entire generation of men who are turning 30 who have never yeah. approached women or, or had to go with, without their digital gadget in their hand who, who've done it analog. There's an entire generation. And so imagine if you're a dating coach today <laughs> or in the future, you're going to be a premium. You're going to be at a premium to be able to teach men and women how to interact on a social level that isn't through their, you know, social media and stuff. Yeah. It's going to be a premium. You'd be doing, doing well with your dating coach nowadays. Yeah. A hundred percent, a hundred percent agree with that. I feel like there's a yearning, there's a real yearning in men to, to step back from all of this. You know, it's like we're sort of cascading towards a future that is so deeply entrenched in a world that isn't the one we're yeah. designed for this meta world that I think there's just this deep, deep spiritual yearning. And I hear it more in the voices that argue against this than the voices that argue for it. You know, I hear some guys and they, they argue with me about Tinder. They say, dude, you're, you're a dinosaur. You say you're a dinosaur. Course, yeah, yeah. You don't use Tinder, right? Why don't you just optimize your chances? The world's clearly going in this direction. Why don't you just, you know, do what gets you the results? Do And I can hear in their voice as they say it, some sense that they're trying to force this opinion even on themselves. You know, that they don't truly believe it, yeah. but that they can't quite feel the alternative, even though they know it exists, you know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah no, it's true. And it's, uh, but they will come to that. I mean, it, they will come to an equilibrium or a feeling of unrest that it, it, it hasn't been serving them. And maybe it's serving them now for their, for you know, but if, if you are any kind of a contemplative soul or a seeker of any mm -hmm. kind, you will have to go into contemplative types of states, which is including a contemplative approach with meeting women. 
you know, it's the way it goes. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I I was on Tinder um, for the first couple of years that I was also a dating coach and and also actively going out and and meeting women, and I found that even the women that I did meet on the dating apps, even if they were quite beautiful and very nice, there was a lingering sense that I I hadn't earned it, and there was a sort of wow. a bitter a bitter aftertaste, and. And, wow. and, and I, dele- I deleted, I deleted all, all dating apps because I, I felt the sense that I need to cut off all options, right? Sometimes you need to cut off all yes. easy options to actually begin the search for what is valuable. And Tinder represented to me like this half-assing, this mediocrity, right? This, this sort of easy, free dinner. And so even if the women were the types of women that had I met them in real life, I would be completely you know mm. passionate and, and and obsessed by them there was a bitter aftertaste when i met a woman online yeah so interesting hmm. so zan let's let's give some life advice that we're perhaps unqualified to give right so we <laughs> talked about uh we talked about the, the guys and you said don't quit your job right but i've i've got again a couple of clients now and one of them is like look this is the most important thing to me right now is to fix my social life, not just with women, but with men as well, okay. you know, to find my tribe, to network, to meet beautiful women, to, to live life. And yet he, he stays in the house all day, every day, yeah. right? He trains at home. He works out at home. He, ha- he doesn't leave the house except for two days a week. Yeah. And what I've been trying to say to him is let's go back to first principles. Correct. If you're telling me this is the most valuable part of your life, more valuable right now, than your finances, how can you afford not to put focus on it? Like the maximum focus on it, right? As a percentage of your time and your mental energy, how can you afford not to invest that time in this? So what would be your advice for guys who really truly value this, but are stuck in that job? Stuck yeah, I'm, you know, your friend saying that, I, I would, that's my highest priority. It is, that's not true. It is not. Um, because when you feel it to the level of fundamental pain that I cannot abide this anymore, you know, the dude abides, I can't, I can't abide in this situation anymore. You will go to whatever extent. I wrote an anecdote in my book of this, of this uh, man who's listening to a piano concerto and, and the, the pianist is just brilliant. And he's sitting there with tears in the front row, tears streaming down his eyes. And afterwards he goes to the, the pianist and he says, man, I would give anything to play like that. And the pianist looked at him and says, no, you wouldn't. No, you wouldn't. Right? And so it has to consume you and, 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 and it has to be that important to you that you prioritize it. You know, people say, I, the number one, I want to get healthy this year. That's my number one thing I want to do. But no, they don't really because they, they would prefer, if they're honest with themselves, to watch Netflix and eat Cheetos and 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 not work out, not go for walks and this kind of stuff. They would prefer it, but they can't be honest about that. No, I prefer to be in shape, you know? So um, the, the phrase I've always said um, is this, every great life has had in it a great renunciation. Every great life has had in it a great renunciation. There's no, small measures don't do it. I, I went to, when I was working, writing the Alabaster Girl, I went to, to Nicaragua for four months, lived in a small fishing village, learned Spanish. And the people were so poor, but so happy and so fundamentally full of the desire of life and, and loved their families. And the little kids were, were abundant and they had nothing, relatively speaking. And I came out of that and I went and I did it straight from there to Amsterdam, where I did a weekend intensive with about 25 guys. And I'm sitting there looking around the room and I'm thinking, and they're they're saying, oh, my life sucks because of this and this and this. I'm thinking, we have not put ourselves to the test. We don't know. We're, we're comfortable. We think that, you know, we backed, we backpacked across Europe uh, on this wild adventure for a year. No, you didn't. You went from ATM to ATM, you know, yeah. you scare yourself. You know, 300 years ago, a young man would go to sea in a wooden ship. And, and not knowing, he couldn't call mom to help him when he got he ran out of money. He couldn't go to a bank machine. He couldn't, 
you, there's no medical insurance. You just went and you, and, and, and you went to sea and we don't have that. We're all peace and safety. We guys say, oh, I want to travel, but I got to save a bunch of money first. Yeah. Right. I have to get this first, 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 first. I have to do this. I have to do that. I have to do this. I have to do this. The only thing you have to do is die. That's the only thing you have to do. Everything else is optional. So mm. I really think that for guys who are saying this and, and they want the advice of what, what can I do to get out of this malaise that I'm in and this, and this, this treadmill and all this kind of stuff is every great life has had a great, has had in it a great renunciation. You've got to renounce everything. And I mean it. Renounce it all, all the things that do not serve you to what you want your vision to be and what you want it to be like. Um, it, 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 it's going to take, it's going to take everything you've got and more. That's the truth. That's how bad you got to want it. Yeah. I think it's, for me, I feel almost like this job has been, sounds a bit high and mighty, but it's been some sort of salvation for me because I sometimes internally feel the tendency towards comfort right i think there's this kind of war in every man's mind between adventure and comfort and the comfort is the settling down having a wife and kids living a comfortable easy life with nice food simplicity routine and the adventure is going to war metaphorically right it's yeah. seeking everything at the expense of everything taking risks experience ex extreme discomfort suffering yes. romance beauty love passion that roller coaster. And I feel the pull towards comfort sometimes. I feel that tendency to want to sit and, you know, descend into mediocrity. And I feel, in some senses, spiritually, like my spirituality partly comes from the fact that when I go out with a client, I have to be on, you know, I, I have to be good for them. That yes. is my responsibility. And that allows me to speak to myself as I'm speaking to them, you know? And it's almost like, feels like some sort of salvation that every time of course. I feel that tendency towards mediocrity, I'm forced by responsibility to go out and pull others out of the mud. And so <laughs> I do the same for myself, you know? So I feel really grateful that I was able to burn my bridges and do a job that cut me off from 90% of professions and, 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 and jobs. Like I, I, I don't have access to corporate jobs now. I, they, they've seen too much, you know? And, yeah. and so um, I think maybe what we're hinting at here is like, sometimes you've got to burn your fucking bridges. You've got to go that path for and sure. scorch the earth behind so you can't go back. You've got to burn your ships for sure. And, and if you don't have the, the fortitude to do that, then why would a woman want, have any attraction to what the, the weakness that is you, your domestic pet, you know? you have no conviction you've not you haven't stood on this earth and 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 collided with the earth with your body and with your soul you haven't done it you haven't you didn't bear witness to uh your reason for being born i mean we're talking very it's a call you better believe it's a call this is it's very few men will heed this call and most men will will, will i don't need it or i don't believe it or whatever um but it is really a calling to stand on this earth and and let's let's go forth with different eyes and, and ears and voice. And very few will heed the call. Yeah. But it's real and it's needed. And for those I'm wary of um, your time and, and your time is valuable. So um, just in sort of closing, sure. what 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 can a man do right now if he is one of those who heeds this call, who hears what we're saying? But, you know, every great journey starts with one step. What is the yeah. one step that a man can take in his life right now to head in the direction of beauty and accepting his responsibility to answer that call? Well, that's a good question. Um, recognize, I, I think what the first thing we can recognize is that no one's coming around to help. Um, our father figure is not going to come there and put his arm around your shoulders and say, it's going to be okay. Those days are gone. That mm -hmm. ship sailed. So you've got to look in the mirror at yourself because nobody's going to put their arm around you 
and say it's it's going to be okay. So you've got to do it for yourself. You got to put your arm around yourself in the mirror and say it's okay. I got you. And 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 forgive yourself. Forgive yourself all the seeming trouble and mistakes and things you've done in the past. Forgive yourself because we're just guys trying to figure it out. Nobody t- teaches us. So I think that's the first step. Is it's not self acceptance. It's self. It's um. It's self. I don't know what it is. It's it's different than self acceptance. It's not t- it's not settling into okay. This is me. And that's how it, how it is. I'm going to be okay with it. No, it's saying you're that little boy who we wanted who is sincere, and you still are. So don't forget it. And and let's be, and let's remember that we're all that to the day we die. We're sincere. We want to know. So we're a student of life. No one can take that away from you. Like a, a woman can say, I reject you in every possible way, but you cannot reject the fact that you're a student of life, that you're trying. No one can say that. Yeah, that's not true. Uh, yeah. What do you do? For, what do you, what do you do? Well, I'm a student of life. What do you do? <laughs> you know? Yeah. So, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, I really think throw away all the self-help. <laughs> I'm generalizing. I'm being, I'm being an ass, but turn to literature you read what the ancients wrote because there's nothing new under the sun. Nothing the same as that they wrote 2,000 years ago. Um, seek out memorable uh, people to hang out with, memorable experiences. That's generalizing in platitudes. I get it, but you know you gotta you gotta you gotta step forward and take these small steps. But just leave leave what doesn't serve you. Renounce what doesn't serve you. And trust that it's going to be okay. Yeah. Trust that it's going to be okay. Now, I remember one of the first events I ever did, there was a student in the audience. He goes, you know, Zan, I always thought that if I ever, if I followed my dreams, the danger was that I'd be pushing a shopping cart, sleeping in a cardboard box, living under a bridge. But then he said, I, re- I realized this, nobody who's pushing a shopping cart wrapped in a cardboard box, sleeping under a bridge is there because they followed their dreams. Nobody. That's interesting. Nobody. Yeah. You know, if, if, you, if you put your foot into the void, you take that step and, the, and you, you're not sure what's there, your foot will always, always hit something. I can't remember who did this interview, but it's, re- it's absolutely true. He said, if you step into the void and you, put, and you t- challenge yourself and you head towards whatever it is that your, your, your horizon that you see. He said, at the point where you're at this, the most despairing, I can't do it anymore. I'm out of money. I, I'm, I'm not going to survive. At that point, when, it's, when it's, everything's too late, somebody or something or somebody will arrive in your life. And imagine that. It's like the hero's quest, you know? That somebody will arrive at that moment and it will happen. And I, I'm, I'm convinced of that. Dude, so, I'm more than convinced because I think we need to look at how our lives have played out so far to find the experiences where that was. Look, look, look at the distance case. behind you and, and the path you came. Yeah. And yeah. look at each moment, each moment where you fell into the void, where you're at your worst and something pulled you. Like for me, it is literally a lineage. My life, my, my past plays out like a lineage of me almost losing total control yeah. and then someone or something bringing me out of that right. in a moment, it, whether it's a book, um, a role model, a conversation. Or... I think I lost you again. Uh, yeah. Sorry about that. We're back. Okay. We're back. Okay. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm with you there, brother. I'm with you there. It's 100%. like our lives play out like one salvation after the other. And it's it's faith. If you trust that that's gonna happen, it usually it usually does. Yeah. Um man, I've I've really enjoyed this conversation. This was partly a selfish thing, just I just really wanted to talk <laughs> to you because um your your book, you, you you say drop the self-help, but honestly, your book was uh for me it was it was what self-help really should be, which is a crystallization of principles that I understood, but had never created the web, that sort of concrete hole. And your book just allowed me to, I guess, organize, for lack of a better term, 
all of these principles and connect them all that I already, I suppose, was teaching and, and was, was thinking about. So it was, to me, the greatest form of self-help. So I really appreciate it. Appreciate that. It, was a, it was a beautiful poem more than anything. And sometimes, as you say, literature is the self-help that we need. Right? That's right. It's, it's the vehicle of the content and not just the content itself. Um, yeah, so, sure. so why don't you tell yeah. yeah so why don't you tell um tell everyone what are you working on now what is this new book when's it oh coming out God. where can people find you uh i'm writing a second book and i'm struggling um i'm not <laughs> prolific i uh i really am thinking a lot about it and i think about yeah. it day and night but i'm also lazy and i hang out with my girl a lot you know so mm -hmm. um so yeah and it's it, it, and it's it's not about men and women, yes, even though it is. It's more, it's it's hard to describe. It's very, along the lines of what we've been talking about here, you know, what is a, a life well lived, basically? What does that look like? So I'm, I'm writing that book. It's not easy. I'm, I'm working on it day and night. My other book, I have a copy here, Alabaster Girl. Anybody wants a copy? Can you see it? 400 yeah. pages. 400 pages, 10 years to write. Uh, you can get it on Amazon or you can, I can, I sign copies. I have copies in Romania where I am. We, every couple of years, we, we print off a couple thousand copies and I sign books. I did the, did the math and I've signed over 6,000 books and sent them from Romania in the mail to different people. So if you want to sign copy for me, you just have to pay for the shipping and the, and the handling. And, uh, and it's a gift to you. And it's, you just go to alabastergirl.com. And I'll sign a book, wow. pop it in the mail. Yeah. It's yeah. insane. Wow. Yeah, it's 10 yeah. bucks. It's 10 bucks, but it costs me the, the, the cost of the book to print it in Romania, the postage, the, you know, all that kind of stuff. It's a break even thing. And so it's kind of a gift to people. So, um, and, and then I'd like to hear what people think about it, you know, after they've read it. So, dude, I mean, it's top, top, honestly, top five books I've, I've ever read in terms of books that have, have had an impact wow. on me. Appreciate um, so, that. And, and I'm a, I'm quite a prolific reader uh, as well. So it connected with me yes. on a on a really really fundamental level. So I know it will do for the guys watching this as well because a lot of these guys have been following me for five six seven years, and yeah. you know someone inside out after that. So <laughs> I highly recommend. Um, Very kind of you to say that. You know, yeah, I'll true, give man. it as a gift. I'll give it as a gift to guys. You just pay for the shipping and the cost of the book. I think I lose a dollar a book, but I want people to read it. So, <laughs> and I'll sign it. I'll, and I'll put a bookmark in it for you. And I'll send it in the mail. That's <laughs> insane. <laughs> and and if people want to, I don't know. I I'm not I'm not certain of I, I guess what you're offering at the moment in terms of coaching and materials. Okay. Is there any way people can find more about your philosophy? Yeah, I've got a, I've got an online course and and which is the Ars Amorata course, the Essentials course. And we do it. We just started a class. We started every three months. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's a waiting list. If you go try and sign up for now, if you go to, to uh, well, I'll, I'll say it in a second. But the guys who go through this 90 day program, they graduate as members of what we call the Amirati. Ars Amirata is fake Latin. The Amirati mm. is fake Latin. And we have members that we've had for 15 years. And we have, you know, we have gatherings around the world. We have a, a, a super conference in the spring and the fall. We've got members that, you know, in 30 countries, 40 countries. And so you can go sign and get on the wait list for the next class, which I think will be in a, a couple months from now. And, um, and then you, you're, you're part of that inner circle and that conversation. And we have, you know, great fun and parties. And that's our group. Um, so that's called the Amirati. So if you go to Amirati.net, A-M-O-R-A-T-I.net, mm -hmm. there's a wait list. Put your name on the wait list and sign up for our next essentials program. You'll see me in the calls. We have Zoom calls. We have, you know, a weekly thing. And then you graduate and you're part of this, this membership for forever, for life. And it's, it's, it's the guys that when, when women say, where are the real men in this world? I'll tell you where they are. <laughs> They're right over there, the Amirati. <laughs> so they can find me there. They can go to zanperian.com, Um I, do, I don't do a lot of personal coaching these days, one-on-one mm -hmm. -on -one coaching type thing. And I did a lot of that. Uh, I do for very specific situations. I call it my Winston Wolf coaching, you know, Winston Wolf on Pulp Fiction came in, they had a body, 
clear out of that car in 45 minutes. Okay. Call him this guy. He's going to solve your problem. <laughs> well, I mean, if you have a problem with it, with it, with your relationship or a, a woman you've been seeing or you're dating or your wife and, and you don't know your next steps or what she's thinking, if you bring it to me, I'll solve it. Close enough. Close but enough. I don't do it very often because I'm writing. Yeah. Yeah. And seeking beauty endlessly. Yeah. So Amorati, A-M-O-R-A-T-I dot net. It's a fake Latin word. Ours and Rod is fake Latin. What happened was um, I was, uh, years ago, I was interviewed by a woman for a magazine and she mentioned my influences. I read Casanova's uh, memoirs and I read the auto Me autobiography of Benvenuto Cellini, who was the mm -hmm. Forrest Gump of his day. And the Ars, Ama Ars, Ars Amatoria by mm -hmm. Ovid. Roman poet, which is a book is basically the book on the art of love and how to get girls in ancient Rome. The Ars Amatoria, he wrote it 2000 years ago. Mm -hmm. And she misquoted me in the magazines and liked all these books and including Ovid's Ars Amorata. So it's fake Latin. It didn't mean anything. So I, I absconded it. I took it. It's my trademark. And so we've Ars Amorata is the name of our brand for, you know, 20 years. And the Amorati is our name of our membership. So, yeah. Not to be confused with Illuminati, but not, not to be. Well, how do you know? Ah, <laughs> <laughs> we are the Illuminati, <laughs> the model Illuminati based on love as their core principle. It's amazing. That's cool, brother. Th thank you so much for coming on, man. As I said, like for me, this is just a, a great pleasure to be able to have this this conversation with you. Um, because I think, as you said at the start, I, I honestly think the message is more potent and more immediate now than it yeah. has ever been before. And Correct. so I want to reinvigorate this message for at least my audience um, and for anyone who gets the chance to watch this because I think it's too important to ignore. So thank you for putting your word out there, man, man and taking that responsibility, um, you know, and, and living what you preach, you know? So well, thank you for having I me. appreciate it, brother. Um, all, all, all links I'll attach in the, in the description to the video. Okay. And, and dude, I'd love to do a follow up to this. Let's see if the world has uh, some semblance of normality <laughs> and, and, and <laughs> naturalness over the coming, coming months and years. But uh, I'd love to do a follow up in the future, brother. Okay, you bet. I've enjoyed this a lot. Thank you for having me. It's been, You're uh, very welcome, man. Fast. You bet. Take care, brother. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye-bye.